Well, this morning our scripture text is not a uh, long one, and, um, it, but it is a very important one where John uh, actually in, in a couple of verses tells us a couple of different things. I originally thought that the two verses were actually referring to the same kind of thing or at least the Gospels in general, but I see that there's a bit of a distinction between what he's saying, but at the very least we do see here why it is that John wrote this gospel. Not surprisingly, that he might demonstrate to us who Jesus is, that he is the Christ, the Messiah, the Savior, the only one through whom we can be saved, and he is the Son of God. And the reason why he wanted us to see these things was so that we might be saved. So let me read this passage of Scripture, these two verses, and then we'll go ahead and and dig into it. Um, and let me just remind you before I read this that these are not the words merely of the Apostle John. This is the Word of God. These are the exact words that our Lord intended John pen so that we might know what it is He wanted us to know. We read in verse 30 or beginning in verse 30, therefore many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book, but these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in His name. Well, may the Lord bless our understanding, and may He open His words to us this morning. We can understand what He's saying and that we might also benefit from them. Now, I just want to remind you that last time John had finished really showing us his account of those essential elements of the gospel, the same ones that Paul was referring to in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 through 5. First of all, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that our sins were laid upon Jesus and He died in our place. He took God's wrath upon Himself for us, that He might carry those sins away forever and discharge them and that we might be free, and that He was buried. John showed us the Prince of Life was actually put into a tomb, and the one through whom we were to receive life was actually under the power of death for three days. Now, certainly that was to fulfill the Scriptures because that's what the Scripture said, that's what Jesus said, but perhaps it was also three days to further prove to us that He was, in fact, dead. And Paul says that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. Remember last time we saw that because He had paid for our sins, and it was our sins that required His death, it was our sins that held Him in its power. Once those sins were discharged, once they were paid for, death could no longer hold Him. And He rose again on the third day. He rose again in order that God might show the world that Jesus was who He claimed to be and that Jesus had done what He said He would do and that we might know that our debt was paid and that Jesus has conquered death for us because He lives we will live too. Now, as John begins to wind down his inspired historic account to its conclusion of the person and work of our Lord Jesus Christ, he tells us two more things. Now, he's going to tell us some other things, of course, in chapter 21, but we do see two things in our text this morning. First of all, that Jesus did some more of, of his work. He continued to work with his disciples uh, to further prepare them to be His witnesses of His resurrection by showing them many more signs. And secondly, we see why John wrote down what he did of Jesus' work, why he selected the particular signs that he did and the particular uh, teachings that he did. It was in order that we might know Jesus is the Christ that He is the Son of God and that believing in Him we might have eternal life. We need to understand that really the Gospel of John was written uh, as an evangelistic tract. That's what John intended. You know, we, we try to make our tracts very short and concise so that people will read them, 
John wrote down 21 chapters as an evangelistic tract to demonstrate what it is that the Lord wants us to demonstrate to others. Uh, so even though we might be able to summarize it into a small tract, we need to understand there is much more to it. And John understood that. And we need this. We need this gospel for that reason. Well, let's look at these two things. First of all, John tells us that Jesus further prepared His disciples to be the witnesses of His resurrection by giving them more proof of that resurrection and, of, of course, who He is. John writes in verse 30, Therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. Now, let me just again, first of all, remind you of what a sign is. A sign is, is a pointer, something that points away from itself, beyond itself, to something or to someone else. Now, we often talk about the Lord's Supper as being a sign. It's a sign and a seal. It seals basically God's grace to us. It's God's seal to us that if we have trusted in Jesus, our sins are forgiven. But it's also a sign that points beyond itself to the reality that it actually represents, just like a street sign. You know, when we're looking for a particular street, we look for the street signs because, you know, they tell us the names of the street. But when we see the sign, we don't say, ah, the street I'm looking for, and we look at the sign. We understand the sign is pointing to the street that we're looking for. Just like the road signs as we're traveling down the highway and we're going to a particular city and we say, we see the sign and it says, so many miles to this particular city. We realize we haven't arrived at that city. We realize the sign is pointing beyond itself to that city. In the same way, the bread and the wine point beyond themselves to the reality behind them, which is the body and blood of our Lord broken and shed for us in order that we might have life. Now, in this case, John is speaking of the things that Jesus did further to prove to His disciples, to point them to the fact not only that He was alive, but that He was who He claimed to be, the Christ, the Son of God. Perhaps He showed them more about how His death and His burial and His resurrection fulfilled the Scriptures like He did to the two on the road to Emmaus. Maybe He did more miracles in their sight. Again, these miracles point to Him as the messenger from God and basically prove that what He is saying is, in fact, from God, so we should pay attention. Undoubtedly, John had in mind these continuing appearances of our Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, seeing somebody alive whom you know formerly was dead, and they knew He was dead, remember, He was not only crucified stopped breathing, but a soldier pierced through his side into his heart. Blood and water came out. He ruptured his heart. He couldn't live after that. And he had been three days in the tomb. Now suddenly he's alive. Certainly that qualifies as a miraculous sign. Jesus did more of these signs. Now I do believe that John is pointing to the things that Jesus did after his resurrection rather than before His resurrection. Notice when He writes in verse 30, many other signs Jesus also performed. And again, the word other is pointing us to what it is that just preceded it, or it's pointing to something that did precede, something other than what He was doing. And we might ask, well, other signs other than what signs? Well, He might mean other than those that he had already recorded in his gospel except for the fact that he says these things were not recorded in this gospel. Well, maybe he's referring to the other gospels and what they recorded. That's certainly possible. Or he may be speaking of the signs that Jesus did other than the signs that he had just shown them following his resurrections and the one or his resurrection and the ones that he showed only them. Remember, John has just told us that Jesus appeared to His disciples on the first day of the week, the day of His resurrection, minus Thomas, and then He appeared a second time to His disciples with Thomas. 
So perhaps he's referring to those particular signs to prove to them that he is in fact alive. Notice also to whom John says that Jesus showed these signs. These were exclusively for the disciples. Therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples. And again, those may be recorded in other Gospels, but certainly a lot of what Jesus did was public and not just for them. What John is referring to here are not his public signs, not his public miracles, but those he did privately purely for the benefit of his disciples and not just for the 11 remaining disciples, but also for the others who had followed him. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 6 through 8, that after Jesus revealed himself to his intimate circle of disciples, that is the 11, um, he then appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also, and Luke goes on to tell us in Acts chapter 1 verse 3 that he did this over a period of 40 days. John says, therefore many other signs Jesus performed in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book. Now why did Jesus reserve these signs only for them? Now, whether they were written in the other Gospels, whether we read about them later in the other books, we do know that John says they weren't written here, but we do know they were for the disciples. Why did Jesus do these things for them? Well, He did it to confirm their faith and to prove to them that He had risen from the dead. Why did Jesus do many other signs, uh, John tells us here? It's because he wanted them to have not just a little evidence, not just one appearance where they might wonder whether or not they had really seen Jesus, but he wanted them to have overwhelming evidence because they were called to a very special task, and that was to be his witnesses. They were the ones who were going to preach his resurrection. And so they had to be fully convinced that what they were about to risk their lives for, and they were going to risk their lives, you know, several of them died telling others about Jesus Christ. They needed to know that was absolutely true. Now think about this for a minute. Would you be willing to lay your life down for something that you really did not believe? Would you be able to speak confidently of something that you were not fully convinced was true. I think you see that you will only go as far as your convictions will take you. And this is perhaps one of the things that weakens us and weakens our desire to serve the Lord more than just about anything else and to share His message more than anything else is the fact that oftentimes we lack the conviction that these things are true. And we're not really willing to throw ourselves into it fully because we're not fully convinced that it's real. But you see, if we are to be as effective, or if we are to be effective at all, we have to be convinced that these things are true. When you are convinced beyond the shadow of a doubt, not only of the truth of something, but also of its importance, not only for yourself, but also for others, and we might add into that when you're also concerned about its impact upon others. That will enable you to speak with confidence and with power. And that's really the kind of witness that the, our Lord wants us to bring to this world if we are to point them to the Lord Jesus Christ. Not just, I, I think this is true. Here, why don't you read this? Maybe it'll do you some good you know, that kind of thing. We need to have a full conviction. These things are true, and because they're true, they're in danger. They're going to go to hell if they don't repent and believe the gospel, and they're not going to repent unless they hear, and only those who know can actually tell them. We need to be convinced that that is true. 
Now, Jesus wanted them to have a strong conviction, and so He gave them abundant proof so that they might speak confidently for Him. And I think we see that what Jesus did actually had that effect upon them. We have one grand example of Peter when he was speaking to Cornelius and his household in Acts 10, verses 38 through 43. He said this to them, You know of Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed Him with the Holy Spirit and with power, and how He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with Him. We are witnesses of all the things He did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They also put Him to death by hanging Him on a cross. God raised Him up on the third day and granted that He become visible, not to all the people, but to witnesses who were chosen beforehand by God, that is to us, who ate and drank with Him after He arose from the dead. And He ordered us to preach to the people and solemnly to testify that this is the one who has been appointed by God as judge of the living and the dead. Of Him all the prophets bear witness that through His name everyone who believes in Him receives forgiveness of sins. Now, again, one of the things that um, we, we note in Peter was that there was a change in him from uh, before Pentecost and after Pentecost, before the resurrection, after the resurrection. He had a confidence that he didn't have before. Now, we know that this confidence came from the Holy Spirit who empowered him to be able to give this kind of a witness, but we do need to understand that one of the ways the Spirit of God actually does this is by His showing us the truth and the importance of what it is that we believe. He doesn't just give us power, and that power doesn't do anything. That power focuses our minds. It shows us, again, the reality of these things. It proves to us how important they are so that we act upon them. This is what the Spirit of God does. So the Spirit not only came upon Him in power, but also bore witness to the truth that Jesus had shown them that He was alive from the dead, that He was raised again from the tomb. Now John said that Jesus did these things in the presence of His disciples so that they would have the confidence they needed to be His witnesses. Jesus did this for them and He showed it only to them. But now the question arises, what has He given to us so that we might have this same level of confidence. Well, He has given to us the gospel. He has given to us the gospel of John. He has given to us His Word and His Spirit. Now, we see second that John wrote down what Jesus did so that we might know that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing in Him, we might have eternal life. We have an eyewitness account. We have this evangelistic tract not only so that we might be saved, but so that we might have what we need to convince others of the truth of the gospel, the eyewitness testimony of those who actually saw Him and who handled Him, as it were, who touched Him and who heard Him. John writes in verse 31, but these have been written, that is, these signs that Jesus did, so that you may believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in His name. Now, I would just draw your attention for a moment to something that John said earlier to Thomas in this same chapter, just one verse before our text. Remember, Thomas wasn't there the first time Jesus appeared, but, and he said, I'm not going to believe unless I put my finger in his hand unless I put my hand in his side and I have to see it with my own eyes. Well, then Jesus, when he appears to Thomas, he says in verse 29, because you, you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are those who have not seen, but believe. Now, again, I, I told you last time we shouldn't fault Thomas because the other disciples didn't believe until they saw either. So they're all basically in the same boat, but still what Jesus says is true. Blessed are those who have not seen, but believe. 
There were those who saw him who believed. The disciples did. But there were many more who would not see and yet who would believe because of their testimony. Now, we see this in the book of, of Acts as they go out preaching, they're bearing witness to the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and many people are saved. But the disciples have finished their work. The disciples have left this world, and they've gone to heaven. Uh, we no longer have them here to bear witness to this. So how is anybody going to hear their message now, their testimony of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ? Well, obviously, Jesus ordained that before they left that they write down a record of His life, an inspired record. And John is one of the four witnesses that has done this in the Gospels so that we might know that Jesus is the Christ, that we might know He is the Son of God, and that believing in Him, we might be saved. Now, I've already told you this is John's purpose behind, be, behind writing his gospel. And this is what shaped his selection of the life of Jesus, looking over everything that he did. And he's going to remind us at the very end of this gospel that Jesus did and said so many things that, that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. I mean, books are still being written about what Jesus said and did. But John said... That could easily happen because he said and he did so much. But his selection had this particular purpose in mind, to prove who Jesus was. And that, again, knowing that we might be saved. So I thought this might be interesting just briefly to touch on a few of these things to remind us of what it is that John showed us about Jesus. He, he recorded these particular signs such as Jesus turning of the water into wine at the wedding of Cana of Galilee, a miracle that only God could perform. His healing of the sick man at the pool of Bethesda in Jerusalem. Remember the man who couldn't even get up at the stirring of the waters and eventually who was going to be indicted by the Jews for picking up his pallet and carrying it on the Lord's day. Jesus made him whole again. His feeding of the 5,000 with the five small loaves and the two fish, 5,000 men besides women and children at Bethsaida. His walking on the water. Remember after the feeding, he sent the disciples ahead and they were rowing all night long and were barely making any progress. And then Jesus comes at night walking on the water. That was between Bethsaida and Capernaum on the Sea of Galilee. His healing of the man who had been born blind at Jerusalem. And remember, the opening the eyes of the blind was something peculiar to the work of Messiah. His raising of Lazarus from the dead at Bethany. Remember the brother of Martha and Mary. He had been in the tomb for several days and they expected a stench to come out of the tomb. But instead, when they opened, rolled away the stone, Lazarus comes out. Jesus raised a dead man to life. And of course, his betrayal, his death, and particularly His resurrection at Jerusalem. This proves that He is the Christ. This proves that being, of course, the Christ and the one who is the Savior and the one who is the prophet of God, and it verifies His claims to be the Son of God. Only Christ could do these things. Only the Son of God could do these things. And that is why John recorded these particular items. It's also why John recorded the particular words of Jesus that he did, such as his conversation with Nicodemus at Jerusalem regarding the necessity of the new birth. You must be born again if you are to see the kingdom of heaven, if you are to enter into heaven. His conversation with the woman at the well of Samaria when he, he said, if you had known who it was that was speaking with you, you would have asked of him and he would have given you living water. Again, Jesus showing himself to be the source of life to all who will ask. His teaching about the two resurrections, the spiritual resurrection, from spiritual death to life for all who believe in His name and the physical resurrection that He's going to bring about before the final judgment. His discourse on the bread of life after He fed the 5,000, that all who will believe in Him, all who will feed upon Him spiritually will have eternal life. His teaching at the Feast of Booze in Jerusalem regarding the life-giving spirit that He gives to everyone who is thirsty. Remember, He cried out on the last day of the feast as they were pouring that water out of the base of the altar. If anyone is thirsty, 
Let him come to me and drink. Out of his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water, even as the Scripture says. The parable of the Good Shepherd, where Jesus tells us that all who hear his voice and follow him will have eternal life, and they shall never perish. And of course, at the resurrection of Lazarus, his declaration that he is the resurrection and the life, that everyone who believes in him will never die. And of course, throughout the, throughout the Gospel of John, there are those claims by Jesus that He is the I Am. He is, in fact, God in human flesh. You know, the funny thing is that um, recently somebody asked me, gave me uh, the name of an author and asked me, is this, is this author good? Is he, is he conservative? He was a New Testament scholar. So I looked him up online to see where his background was, Princeton Seminary. He's teaching at Princeton. Well, there's a big red flag right there. Uh, what kind of books has he written? Well, here's one book that says how neither Jesus nor his disciples ever claimed that he was God. And I thought, <laughs> what, what Bible have you been reading? We just went through the Gospel of John where John claims that he's God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. I mean, what more do you want? And Jesus says, before Abraham was born, I am, I and the Father are one. The Jews picked up stones to stone him. For what good work are you stoning me? Jesus said, and they said, not for a good work, because you, being a man, make yourself out to be God. Obviously, Jesus claimed that he is God, and John recorded not only those statements, but the evidence that was necessary to prove that this was, in fact, true. That Jesus is the Christ that God promised. He is the Messiah. He is the one that the Father anointed and sent into the world to be the only Savior of mankind. There are not many ways to God. There is only one. And to prove that He is, in fact, the eternal Son of God who became man and who lived among us that He might show us the Father. And by the way, His resurrection proves that all of these things are true. If Jesus had been one grand deceiver and liar, he would have remained in the grave. But God raised him again to life to prove that everything he said was true. I mean, if, as, as though the miracles he had already done were not enough. He seals it with his death and he's raised again to life. It vindicates everything that Jesus said. He is, in fact, the Son of God. He is the Savior, the only way to be reconciled with the Father. So that believing these things to be true, John says, we might trust Him and receive eternal life. Remember what John said to Nicodemus in, in perhaps the at least the most famous verse in all of Scripture, and let's not miss the one following. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through Him. Now, as I mentioned before under the first point, Jesus gave His disciples what they needed to be able to carry on their work as the witnesses of His resurrection. He gave them many more signs to confirm their faith. But He's also given us what we need to confirm ours. First of all, He's given us what we need to be saved. John's eyewitness testimony of who Jesus is, what He did, what He said. And of course, He's given us His Holy Spirit so that He might bring these things savingly home to our hearts so that we might see their truth, know they're real, desire this Savior, desire His paths, what it is He calls us to do that we would believe and be saved. Let me ask you this morning, do you believe His witness as we've gone through the Gospel of John? Do you believe what it is that John has written down? Has God given you His Holy Spirit to open your eyes and to show you the reality and the beauty of these things and have you embrace the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? If not, if you're not, if you... If if you know you haven't, because as we saw at the end of John chapter 3, you're not obeying the Lord, then ask Him to grant you this blessing 
I read verse 17 because I want you to see God didn't send His Son into the world to judge the world, to condemn the world. He sent His Son into the world so that it might be saved. Jesus didn't come to condemn. He came to save. He's a Savior. He offers Himself to you as a Savior. So reach out and receive the Savior. He is the only way that you can be saved. But for those of us who know Him, remember, Jesus has not only given to us what we need to be saved, but He's also given us what we need so that we can confidently continue His witness to others. He's given us His Holy Spirit, as I've mentioned before, not only to give us the conviction of the reality of these things, but to transform our lives into His image so that we have a life that's consistent with our message, and to give us power and courage to tell others about Him. And He has given us His Word. We not only have what John wrote, but we have the other three Gospels plus the other testimonies in the New Testament letters. Jesus has made abundant provision for us, basically the same provision that He made for His disciples so that we would be equipped, that we would be adequate, that we would have what we need to do what the Lord has called us to do. And we wouldn't have just a little, but we would have a lot, both of His Word, both of His truth, and of His Holy Spirit. That's what the day of Pentecost was all about. Jesus has made provision for us to be His witnesses, the witnesses of His resurrection. Now, let me mention that He's also laid a table for us this morning that He might give us further strength and further power by His Holy Spirit to be His witnesses in this world. And we need really every channel, every means the Lord gives to us in order to strengthen us to do His work. And let me just mention one other thing, and this is something that we need to key in on perhaps on Wednesday evenings, is we can have all the channels turned on. You know, we can be reading His Word, we can be praying, we can be worshiping, we can be coming to the table, we can be doing all these things and we can have this help of the Holy Spirit as it were pouring into our souls, but we can just as quickly lose whatever we gain if we are not willing to obey the Lord every time we fail to do it. I believe we choke, grieve, and lose everything that we gain. If we want to be strong in the Lord, we have to be willing to obey Him. And certainly that is our heart, but we actually have to carry through and do it. And I really also believe this secondly, when we actually do yield to the Lord and do what we know He wants us to do, I believe we get an additional, as it were, infusion of the Spirit of God. We get more of His help to do it. So we have a choice. We're always faced with choices each and every moment of the day, every day of the week. Am I going to do what the Lord wants me to do or am I not going to do it? If I do it, I will grow even stronger in the Lord. But if I don't do it, I'm going to lose the influence that I've gained through all these other things. Maybe not all of it, but I'm going to lose a good portion of it. And you have to remember that in every choice you make, make the choices that are honoring to the Lord. As we prepare to come to the table, let's renew our purpose to do exactly that. We trust in the Lord. We say we believe. Well, remember, repentance is the flip side of faith. Are you repenting of your sins? Turning away from the things you know God tells you not to do. And are you turning into the path of everything you know He commands you to do? That is what He wants you to do. That's what He calls you to do, and that's what you need to do if you are to experience the strength or the power that He actually desires to give to you. So if you, I mean, that is what you need to come to the table, repentance and faith. But that's also what you need to be able to hold on to what it is you're going to gain at the table and what, you, what it is you may have gained through His Word this morning or what you have gained through worship. If you want to hold on to those things, you have to yield every moment to the Spirit of God as He leads you in the Word of God. He will give you additional strength if you do, but if you don't, you will lose that influence. We, of course, as believers, want to hold on to it so that we will be strong in Him. Well, let's think about those things.
as we prepare to come now to the table. Let's, uh, let's spend a few moments in silent prayer.